Well, good morning, everyone. Innisfil Baptist Church has been meeting in our building for about two Sundays now, but some recent developments have caused us to make a decision to return to doing some on-air worship services instead of on-site worship services. So this week, I think around, um, well, Friday, uh, July the 10th, the Alberta Health Services uh, reported a slight increase of COVID-19 cases in central Alberta with three new cases in Red Deer. Currently, our understanding is that there are two patients in the hospital, but thankfully none of them in the intensive care units. Alberta-wide, there are about 46 patients right now that are in hospital with COVID-19, seven of whom are in ICU. Out of abundance of caution, we've decided, because we have so many seniors in our church, we've decided to close our doors once again to on-site worship until further notice and until we see some improvement in those numbers. So we welcome you back. We welcome you back to our online version of our worship time here at Innisfil Baptist Church. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning as we come before the Lord and as we start our day together? Let's pray. Father in heaven, these are truly difficult and strange times that we live in. We want to give you thanks, first of all, that you have kept, for the most part, the town of Innisfail and the residents of Innisfail, and especially our seniors in the senior homes, safe and secure and free from COVID-19. And it's our desire as a church to be as cautious as we can to make sure that we don't pass that on to someone within our community. So here we are. We're meeting once again online instead of on site. And we pray, God, that our time together around your word, as we listen to some songs and some music, as we pray together and as we just come together again in the book of Revelation, that you would speak to us and encourage us and make us aware of your presence. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to begin with a couple songs, and then um, we'll take a bit of a break, and then we're going to get back into the book of Revelation this morning. So just uh, join me in a, another minute or two after you uh, listen to and maybe join in singing with these next two songs.
sing your praises and I'll reign with you throughout eternity Well, welcome back. Now, before we get into uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 22, uh, we're going to listen to one more song, but I just wanted to make a couple quick announcements uh, for you all. Uh, we're really not sure when we're going to be back to on-site uh, services. We'll just have to kind of wait and see how that unfolds. So I trust that you'll be patient with us and do join us here Sunday mornings for our online worship services together. And if you can, uh, within our church family, would you pray for some of our missionaries, Jim and Sherry, missionaries in Mexico. Many of you know them personally. Uh, we've been tracking with them and following them in prayer for years, and we would ask that you would just pray for them this morning because that, too, is a hotbed and, a, and a, quite a hot zone for COVID-19, and there's a lot of suffering that's going on in Mexico right now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So pray for Jim and Sherry. Uh, the other thing that uh, we would encourage you to pray for is would you pray that God would guide us and direct us and give us wisdom about how to reopen. We know that some of you are anxious to be back here and we'd love to be back here on site and all of us would be for sure. And it's always a fine line to try to figure out what is the best course of action in these days. So pray for us as a board and as elders and as leaders in the church that God would give us wisdom and direction about how to do reopening safely and care for the seniors that are in our presence. So we'd appreciate if you do those two things. Now we're gonna to listen to one more song, Crown Him With Many Crowns, and then I'm gonna invite you to come on back and join us for Revelation chapter 22.
All right, well, welcome back. Well, you might want to grab your Bible. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 22 this morning. We're coming near to the final verses of the book uh, this Sunday and likely next Sunday, and that will uh, bring us to the conclusion of chapter 22 and the entire book of Revelation. Uh, but uh, just before we get there, just uh, let me just make a couple uh, remarks and introduction by way of introduction this morning before we read chapter 22, uh, verses 5 and following. You know, about a month ago, I think, I suggested another possible or alternative outline for the book of Revelation. I've suggested many along the way, but I suggested that we could use a series of five windows, five windows that kind of open up the book for us. And each of those five windows, John shouts out to his readers, behold, behold, look, it's a command. And as they look, as they look where John is directing their vision and their eyes and helping them to see, they're going to see a hope-filled vision of Jesus. And it will give them strength and courage to overcome the darkness that they're living in. Now, Revelation chapter 22 is part of one of those windows, window number five. It starts in chapter 19, verse 11, and it goes on into chapter 22. And here, once again, we have a window where John is saying, look. He says, I want you to see, I want you to look, I want you to see, I want you to behold. And when we look, when we behold, we don't see something, we see someone. And the window of heaven is opened, and we see Jesus. What an incredible window, that fifth window. And from there on, from chapter 19, verse 11, right through to the end of the book, we're getting this incredible image of Jesus. Now, let's not forget that the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ. Now, in the Greek, the book was called the Apocalypse of Jesus. The apocalypse means the unveiling, the unveiling of Jesus. And the whole point of the book is to engender and to encourage an encounter with the living Jesus. And here, in the final chapters of Revelation, John pulls back the curtain on that window, that window number five, and he opens the window wide open And that final window is open, and we have an encounter with Jesus in all of his splendor. And we see him described in so many ways in this chapter 22 of Revelation. He's described as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last in verse 13. Now, speaking of the first and the last, the beginning and the end... I want to draw your attention to the parallels between the first and the last chapters of Revelation. The parallels between the beginning of the book and the end of the book. The parallels between window number one at the beginning and window number five at the end. So let me just draw this out for you really quickly this morning. In window one, John says in chapter one, verse seven, Jesus is coming. And in window number five, we read, Jesus says, and he says it three times, I am coming. Chapter 22, verse 7, verse 12, verse 20, I am coming. In window one, back in chapter one, verse three, John says, for the time is near. In window number five, in chapter 22, verse 10, we read, the time is near near. In window number one, God says of himself, I am the alpha, the omega, in verse, eight, in verse eight of chapter one. And later it says, I'm the first and the last, in chapter one, verse 17. And here in window number five, what do we find? We find that Jesus says, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end in verse number 13 of chapter 22. 
In window number one, way back at the beginning, there's a promise that I will give them the morning star. Chapter 2, verse 28. And in window number five, we have the fulfillment of that promise in chapter 22, verse 16. I am the bright and morning star. Isn't that incredible? It's an incredible picture of how the book is structured, where window one gets repeated and developed and fleshed out in its fullness in window number five. And as we gaze through that, through this first window, we see Jesus, and, and I, want, I want to read chapter 22, and I want you to watch for that word, behold. All right? So if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to read chapter 22, verses 6 to 21, and you just watch for that word, behold, or look. It's a command. And if we obey it, we're going to see a revelation of Jesus. So let me start. This is chapter 22, starting at verse number 6. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. And here it is, verse 7. Behold, look, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And the angel said to me, see that you do not do that. For I am a fellow servant of our, uh, and of your brethren and of the prophets and of those who keep the words of the book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. That is to say, at the end, once you've made your decision, there will be no turning back from this point on. He who is filthy, let him remain filthy. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And here's another one of those words that behold, verse number 12, and behold. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside the city are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Verse 16, I, Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy, of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And it goes on to say, and if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part in the book of life from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, for the next two Sundays, I want to spend some time answering two questions about one phrase in chapter 22. The phrase I want to draw your attention to is the phrase, the time is near. It's it's worded in a couple different ways. It first shows up in chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 3, the time is near. In chapter 22, in verse 6, it says, I want to show you things which must shortly take place. The time is near. In chapter 24, verse, pardon me, chapter 22, verse 10, it says, for the time is at hand. 
So that's the phrase that we're going to look at for the next two Sundays. The time is near. The time is at hand. The time is short. And the two questions that I want to try to answer this Sunday and next Sunday are these. Number one, the time is near for what? The time is near for what? And the second question is, the time is near so what? What difference does it make? The time is near for what? And the time is near so what? Now this concept of the time being near runs throughout the New Testament quite regularly. And let me just read a couple of verses for you and remind you of them. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11, it says, and do this knowing that, the, knowing that it is high time. It's high time to wake up out of your sleep, says Paul. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. The time is near. John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, that the world is passing away and the lust of it. The world is passing away. Little children, it is the last hour, the time is near. And Jesus himself said in Mark chapter 1, verse, 16, verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the time is near, the time is fulfilled for the kingdom of God is at hand. The time is near. Now the Greeks, of course, they had a couple different words that get translated into the English word time. One of the Greek words for time was the word chronos, from which we get chronological or chronology. And it has to do with chronological time, 24 hours in a day, 30 days in a month, 12 months in a year. It's chronological time. But the Greeks also had a second word for time. It was the word kairos. And the word kairos refers to a unique moment in time. A, di a, a divinely appointed moment in time. An example of that that sometimes we might use in our daily English is, I just happen to be in the right place at the right time. That's kairos time. That's appointed time. That's being in the right place at the right time. It's not chronological time. So the time is near. And the question is, the time is near for what? And we already said we're going to try to answer that in two ways. The time is near for what? And then time is near so what? So let, let, let's look at that first idea. The time is near for what? And I just want to mention a couple quick things as we look at that passage this morning. The time is near for what? Well, the time is near for the coming of Jesus. It's repeated in this passage three times. Verse 7, behold, I come quickly. Verse 12, behold, I come quickly. Verse 20, surely I am coming quickly. The time is near. The time is near for the coming of Jesus. Secondly, the time is near for God to answer that how long, O Lord, prayer of the saints. You might remember that way back in chapter 6. How, lo how long, O Lord? How long until you avenge the death and the blood of the saints? Well, the time is near for that. Justice is at hand. It's right around the corner. God is going to bring about an answer to that prayer. The time is near. The time is near for the coming of Jesus. It's time to answer that question, how long, O Lord? Thirdly, the time, we've already discovered this already, haven't we? The time is here, it's near for the wicked triad, for the beast, the prophet, and the dragon to be finally cast into the lake of fire and tormented there forever and ever. And we read about that in chapter 19, verse 20, and again in chapter 20, verse 10. The time is near to do away with that evil triad, that wicked triad. And number four, the time is near for the curse, for the curse to be dealt with, for the curse including death, sorrow, crying, and pain to be forever vanquished. The time is near for the end of the curse. And we read about that back in chapter 21, verse 4. And number five, the time is near for Jesus to be known by all of the world. Let me remind you of some verses that you're probably familiar with. In chapter 1 
of Revelation verse, 20, uh, verse number 7, we read this. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen, come Lord Jesus. The time is near for Jesus to be known by all the world, every tribe, tongue, and nation. They're going to look upon him who had been pierced on their behalf. In Romans chapter 14, verse 11, we read this. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. The time is near for Jesus to be known by the whole world. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 puts it there for this way. Chapter 2, verse 9 in Philippians. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, the time is coming near, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The time is near. The time is here, near. The coming of Jesus, the coming of, the coming of Jesus into our world in the first place, and the coming of Jesus near the end of time explains much, if not all, of the upheaval that is in our world. Yes, much of the upheaval in our world, much of the conflict, much of the upheaval is because of conflict between nations, between conflict of ideologies and personalities. Yes, much of the upheaval is due to sin and greed and arrogance and indifference. But the final cause, the ultimate cause of all the upheaval that we see in our world is that Jesus has entered into human history and he has been resisted at every point. We see that throughout the whole of the book of Revelation. Jesus breaking through. The time is near. He's arriving. He's coming. And as he comes, the activity of the beast in that wicked triad intensifies. And they're trying with every last breath to resist the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The final cause of all the upheaval in the world is the fact that Jesus is entering, has entered, and is entering into human history. Now, folks, I want you to catch this. Listen to this carefully. Upheaval need not to be feared. We don't have to be afraid of upheaval. Upheaval is not a sign of the absence of God or the absence of Jesus. In fact, the reverse is true. Upheaval is the sign of the presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus being resisted. The time is near. So all the trouble that we have in this world, much of it has to do because people are resisting the Lord Jesus. And the resistance is an indication not that he's far away and divorced from our situation, but that he is nearby and that he is in fact coming in all of his glory. The time is is near. The time is near for what? The time is near for the coming of Jesus. The time is near for the answer to our prayers for justice. It will come to pass. The time is near for the final and the forever defeat of that wicked triad of Satan. The time is near for the permanent removal of the curse that has trapped our world in such darkness for so long. And the time is near for Jesus to be known. And one last thing, the time is near for Jesus to finally have his way. You know, the names that God claims for himself, back in Revelation chapter 1, verses 8 and 17, Jesus claims for himself here in chapter 22, verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and and the end. I am the beginning. You know, the Greek implies before the beginning. Not just I am the beginning, I am before the beginning. The source of the beginning. But also 
the one who is the pattern of everything else that's created, the pattern of everything. Jesus is both the designer even before the beginning and the design after which, after which everything is patterned. Jesus is both the, the, the creator and the pattern in the beginning. I am the beginning. It's a radical claim, isn't it? It means that everything has its source in Jesus Christ. It means that everything in the universe has an imprint of the fingerprints of Jesus Christ on it. It means that every person on this planet owes her or his existence to Jesus Christ, the beginning. And it means that every person ultimately finds his or hers truest identity in the Lord Jesus. I am the beginning. And then he says, I am the end. That word end is the English of the, of the Greek word telos. The word telos in Greek means more, more than just the end, but the end of a series. It means the inherent destiny of the series. Let me give you an example. The telos, that is the inherent destiny, the telos of an acorn is to become an oak tree. That's the trajectory. That's the final destiny of that acorn. The telos of the saints, of course, the final destiny of the saints is to be like the Lord Jesus. And so the scripture says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him face to face. Jesus is our beginning, our pattern, and Jesus is our end, our destiny. The time is near for Jesus to finally have his way. What he began, he will end. What he started, he will finish. He's going to finish that long-awaited redeeming and recreation of the heavens and the earth. And he's going to finish and bring to fruition the inherent destiny of the saints to be with him and to be like him. That's why the book ends with the cry, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Oh, how we long for the destiny to which Jesus is preparing us. Jesus calls himself in this passage the bright and morning star in chapter 22, verse 16. In fact, it's the very last title that he gives himself. It's the very last words that he says about himself, the bright and morning star. Now, the morning star, as you may know, appears when the night has reached its greatest degree of darkness. Indeed, the morning star only appears when the night has reached its greatest degree of darkness. I want to read a, a quote to you from a guy named Bob Godzward. He was an economist, not that that's terribly important, from the Netherlands. And this is what he said about the bright and morning star. He says this, The morning star often appears between 2 and 3 in the morning. When the darkness is complete and the faintest sign of morning is not yet visible. So small is the bright and morning star that it threatens to vanish. The star seems unable to vanquish the overpowering darkness of the night. Yet, when you see the morning star, you know that night is about to be defeated. For the morning star pulls the morning in behind it, just as certainly as Jesus pulls the kingdom in behind him. You know, folks, if you and I could just see Jesus in the midst of our circumstances. If it would help us to keep going, wouldn't it? It 
might still be difficult. It will still be difficult. But when you see Jesus in the midst of your circumstances, you know that the night is going to be defeated. He's the bright and morning star. The time is near because the star is near. Dark, 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 though it may yet still be, it will never again be totally dark when he arrives. The time is near. The time is near. That's the phrase we're looking at. The time is near for what? The time is near so what? And this morning we've drawn your attention to the first answer to that question. The time is near for what? The time is near for the coming of Jesus. The time is near for the answer to our prayers for justice to be done. The time is near for the final and the forever defeat of our enemy, Satan. The time is near, folks, for the permanent removal of the curse and all that, has, all that it has brought into our world, this, the death and the sorrow and the pain and the grief and the tears that come with the curse. The time is near for the end of that curse. The time is near for Jesus to be known for every tribe, tongue, and nation to bow before him and recognize him for who he truly is. And the time is near for Jesus to finally finish what he started in, at the beginning. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And he will finish what he started. And the good work that he has started in you, he will complete and he's going to present you as his saint, as his child, as his bride. He's going to present you glorious, without spot and wrinkle, without blemish before him. The time is near for Jesus to finally finish what he began. Let's close in prayer this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hope that these passages give us. We thank you that Jesus is coming soon. We don't know the hour of the time, the chronological hour of time. But we know that this is going to be a divinely appointed kairos moment. And it's not too far away. It's always imminent. In fact, you have already broken into our world. You came into our world as a babe in the manger. You live in our world right now through us, your saints. You occupy us as your temple. And so you are already breaking into this world. And because that is true, the enemy is putting up a fight. And because he can't beat up you, we become his targets. And we find ourselves embroiled in this spiritual battle. And it's because the time is near. It's because the enemy is resisting your coming. The enemy doesn't want you to establish your kingdom in our lives or in the world to come. So, Father, give us a glimpse of Jesus. Pull back the curtain for us and to help us to see that Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. And in fact, he is in many ways already present. And though not fully present, he is here with us, among us. He walks among the candlesticks, we're told in chapter 2 of Revelation. He's with us right where we are, right where we live and we pray, God, that you'd help us to see him because he indeed is the victor and the overcomer who can empower us to be overcomers. So, Father, help us to do that, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to close with one more song. Uh, this song is pretty incredible. It's a song that you all know. It's the Amazing Grace. But I don't think you've ever heard it like you're going to hear it in a couple moments. So tune in and listen to that. And may God bless you and go with you as you go into this week. And we trust that you'll join us here again online at Innisfil Baptist Church next Sunday. God bless. We'll see you next week.
grace How sweet the sound What a Much has changed in our world lately. 疫情中这么多人失去生命，显明了生命的脆弱与短暂。Pero la asombrosa gracia y amor de Jesús es más fuerte que la vida y la muerte. Wo auch immer du bist, ruf seinen Namen an. Jesus. 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 Jesus.